there's a ton of noise out there. So how do you get decision makers to pay attention to your brand? Start a podcast and invite your ideal clients to be guests on your show. Learn more at sweetfishmedia.com. You're listening to B2B Growth, a daily podcast for B2B leaders. We've interviewed names you've probably heard before, like Gary Vaynerchuk and Simon Sinek, but you've probably never heard from the majority of our guests. That's because the bulk of our interviews aren't with professional speakers and authors. Most of our guests are in the trenches leading sales and marketing teams. They're implementing strategy. They're experimenting with tactics. They're building the fastest growing B2B companies in the world. My name is James Carberry. I'm the founder of Sweetfish Media, a podcast agency for B2B brands, and I'm also one of the co-hosts of this show. When we're not interviewing sales and marketing leaders, you'll hear stories from behind the scenes of our own business. We'll share the ups and downs of our journey as we attempt to take over the world. Just kidding. Well, maybe. Let's get into the show. Welcome back to the B2B Growth Show. I'm your host for today's episode, Logan Lyles, Director of Partnerships here at Sweetfish. I am joined today by Paul Cherry. He is president and founder of Performance Based Results. Mm -hmm. He is also the author of the book, The Ultimate Sales Pro. Paul, how are you doing today, sir? Hey, Logan, I'm doing well. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, Thank you so much for joining us. We're going to be covering a great topic today, the art of questioning uh, throughout the sales process. I think a lot of B2B salespeople and sales leaders out there are going to uh, enjoy this conversation. Before we do that, I would love for you to share with our listeners a little bit about your background, uh, why you're the guy talking about this today, and what you and the team at Performance Based Results are up to these days. Oh, good. Well, wonderful. I am author of the questions that sell the powerful process to discover what your customers really want. So even though you mentioned the ultimate sales pro, my passion is all about uh, questioning skills. And as a matter of fact, it's B2B, the complexity. How do you take, remove the complexity of the B2B sale and make it simple? And there's three things, Logan, ask the right questions. Number one, number two, with the right people. And number three, the right opportunities. And guess what? Sales will follow. So that's what we do. I love it's it. as simple as that. Yep. <laughs> keep it simple. I love any yes. sort of simple framework that we can keep in mind and we can use yes. as sales and marketing folks. Yes. Awesome. Well, Paul, um, the first thing I know you wanted to touch on is the way that sales folks, especially in uh, the complex sale in a B2B environment, maybe enterprise sales, the way salespeople can actually win more by slowing the process down. Tell us a little bit about your thoughts on this. Well, yeah, this, it's it's just that we all know it's a given that you know customers have ac- more access today, uh, are better prepared, are more knowledgeable. Uh, we know there's more competition out there, and as a matter of fact, there's there's an anxiety with a typical B two B sales professional going in that they're almost like they feel that they have to be prepared to defend to persuade, to motivate, to, you know, to tell. And it's like, no, 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 slow down, diagnose and listen. And, and it's, it's, I say this because we all know, for example, you know, it's like, oh, I got a medical condition. I got a problem. I got the sacred pain or where am I? What's the first thing we typically do? <laughs> it's like, we, 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 we go to the internet and, and mm-hmm. we're looking up, okay, the symptoms mm-hmm. and it's right. like, okay, whoa, whoa. You know, the reality is what better place than you, you see the, the clinician, the practitioner, the doctor, and that good doctor is going to slow things down and say, whoa, I don't care what you re- – hold on here. Let me mm-hmm. ask my questions to go through mm-hmm. the process. You right. know, the pa- well, what would you do if a patient comes in and says, hurry up, hurry up. You know what? I already know what I need. You know, I need that uh, codeine or uh, you know, oxycodone. <laughs> <isn't it? laughs> right. You think oh, something else is going on here. Right. So that, that's what I mean. Slow it down. Take your time. The, the real art of selling is, is the ability to listen. That's mm-hmm. a powerful impression. I think typically most salespeople struggle with that. Yeah, uh, that's a great analogy. You know, we're we're quick to rush to uh, oh. find our own diagnosis. You know, WebMD, and then once it scares the heck out of us, and we're convinced <laughs> that everything uh, from yes. a sniffle to leg pain is is cancer, and yes. the good doctor slows it down takes us through a methodical process of, of one leading to another and is able to, to help us, you know, structure our research and help us feel a little bit more calm and, and salespeople kind of can do that same thing. Right. And you know, that's interesting you say that, but because of the exposure of so much in information today, 
customers are confused. Okay, uh, they're led astray, and it's and because we're overwhelmed, what happens is customer pushes back and says, you know what. I, I don't know what what they need is somebody to guide them through the process objectively, strategically, and help them assess and evaluate, uh, f- and, and become empowered to come to the right conclusion. All right, and 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 that's what a good salesperson does with the right questioning skills. Mm-hmm. I love it. So let's dig into some of the good and bad of questioning. Then there, Paul, yeah. um, you mentioned that. Eighty-five percent of the questions salespeople ask, even seasoned ones, mm-hmm. are are actually having a negative effect, either antagonizing the customer or or boring them to sleep. I've I've heard recently, you know, some data out there from Gong that higher level executives uh, they grow really tired of of the bland discovery questions. They want to be educated. So I really curious to hear more of what you've found in in some of the research on. Uh, Mm -hmm. the questioning that is used a lot, but not very effective. Okay. Well, I've done, you know, most of my, you know, uh, questioning based sales training programs, we do live. Mm -hmm. So of the 1200 programs we've done to date, you know, it's, it's just every time it just, it comes out and I don't care whether it's somebody new to sales in B2B or has been selling 25 plus years. It's the same premise, What come, the conclusion is this. Yes, 85% of those questions, and, and I call them, you know, I, I define them as situational questions. They have a purpose, but mm-hmm. yes, they're fact finding. It's mm-hmm. just fact, it says facts, needs, wants, goals, but it's based more or less logical. I'll give you examples of what I mean, but in no order, okay? Whether it's how's it going, who are you using now? What do you like? What don't you like? What's your budget? What are your needs? Um, the decision maker question. What's your timing? Any projects coming up? What do you know about us? What do you like? What don't you like? How can we change? How can we be better? How can we get more business? You see what I mean? Uh, mm-hmm. In no order. What keeps you up at night? Uh, you know, <laughs> There's a classic. how can I help you? How can I help you? Yeah. All those questions. There's two things, two wrong things with those questions. Well, well, well let me, let me be careful with that. They have a purpose. Mm-hmm. They do have a purpose, but a not only uh, did I call them situational, but the ones that I just threw out at you, they're all in the present tense. Okay, mm. yeah, yeah, all in the present tense. So, so here's what happens: eighty eight percent of the questions that we ask are in the present. Now, here's a little secret: where do customers prefer to be in the future? See? Right. Because right. this, you know, it's like the, what's going on now. Unless you step into something by luck, and it's like, oh, I'm so glad you're here. Oh, here's, you know what? I need your help. Solve my mm-hmm. problem. Here's my PO. Right. Money's not in it. How <laughs> how often does that happen? Right, right, but, exactly. But, but so 88 percent are in the present, and what we happen to do is bore people, we antagonize, we interrogate it, we put them to sleep. Customers have a preference to be in the future. Now, as as you go up the food chain, Logan, and when I say food chain, what I mean is higher level executives. Mm -hmm. If anything, yes, those questions will just, you know, it's like, you know, you go need, you know, need to go talk to engineering or a project manager or purchasing with those questions Mm -hmm. because that C level executive is thinking two, three, five years ahead. So Mm -hmm. you've got to be asking the strategic questions, questions. Okay. And Mm -hmm. I can give you an example of what I mean, but. What I didn't tell you is, is this, everything that you want to know to sell into the future is where it's not in the present. (laughs) Well, we've got one option left. There you go. Okay. And that's, what's so crazy is that salespeople rarely, if ever go there, two to 3% of the questions on average go there. And, Mm. and half the time, guess what it is? Hey, how was your weekend? No, that's not a history question. Mm-hmm. You know, no. Yeah. No. So, so the premise there being Paul that if we are effective questioners digging into the past, then we can find out more about what our customers are thinking about in the future, the problems that they're trying to solve to get over that hurdle of the present to get to the future that they're envisioning. Then, right? That's right. That's right. I love it. I love it. So the other thing I know you wanted to share is one question that most salespeople never ask but they really need to know. Really excited to hear your thoughts on this, Paul. And, and that's where it is. That It's that history question. Mm. So it's anytime that you meet somebody 
it's knowing something, but you've got to do it, you know, genuine interest because you're inquisitive. You think from, you know, so Logan, you know, tell me you had, when, when we were talking earlier, you know, you mentioned you settled in Colorado Springs. So tell me what, what prompted you, what originally led you? You see, it's something like to Colorado mm-hmm. Springs. I'm yep. sure I would get a wealth of information in terms of, right. you know, your interests, lifestyle, hobbies, activities, wants, family, right? But, but but my point is, or help me understand some past experience you've had with. See what I mean? Because mm-hmm. what yep. happens is the pain, the frustrations, the ang- uh, anxieties, the doubts, fear, concerns, the emotions is where mm-hmm. I'm going. The emotions yep. are in the past. Yep. Absolutely. And people are emotional and you have to leverage the emotions, drive the emotions and, and, and ride those emotions, not in a good way, not a manipulative way, but a good way to mm-hmm. understand. History has a way, p- past experiences have a way of dictating the future. That's what I mean. Yeah, absolutely. You know, there was a section in a book we read le- recently as a leadership team called Radical Candor. And one of the chapters there talks about uh, career conversations with your direct reports and yeah. how asking them to tell stories of their past and specifically looking for moments of change helped you understand that person better. And I think that that same methodology is here and very poignant in what you're saying, Paul, in how we understand what's motivating, what's driving, how are our clients feeling about where they've been and where they want to go. So I, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, tell us a little more about this simple technique you mentioned to ask fewer questions, but to get more information. So what happens is, and, and, and so the exercise we do in these, in these programs, it's like, okay, give me your top 10 questions. Okay. And then you're going to get in your groups and just let's get them on the board, the flip chart. So, um, and what happens now is the majority of the questions that salespeople ask, um, begin with the who's, what's, where's, when, why's, how's. Um, the five W's. Okay. Mm -hmm. Which, Mm -hmm. which is fine. But what happens is to, I don't want to, when I have a, you know, a a great opportunity to spend some time with somebody, it's important that I ask less questions to get more information. So one of the things that salespeople can need to work on is the ability to ask more of those types of questions that use descriptive openers. And for example, the question, mm-hmm. let's take a let's take a closed-ended question that some salespeople would ask. Believe it or not, the question will come up is, are, are you the decision maker? So, you know, and I hope most people wouldn't ask that, but but in fairness, is it an important mm-hmm. question to ask? And the answer is, well, yes, it is, because you know, you, you got to make sure you're calling on the right people. Mm-hmm. However, is it a risky question or a fo- offensive question? And the answer is, yeah, it is. because yeah, it's, It it's, can it's, be, especially in the wrong delivery, that's for sure. That's right. So how would I salvage it? And so descriptive openers are things like describe, tell me, share with me, explain, help me understand. So it would be to, twi- to take that, are you the decision maker? And I would just tweak it. Describe for me. Describe for me your decision making process. See what I mean? That's mm-hmm. all. So what I'm doing is uh, I'm, I'm salvaging that question turning it from a closed ended to now open ended question. And plus now I'm probably getting three or four questions embedded in that one question in terms of who makes the decisions, how decisions are made, the priorities, you know, maybe even buying criteria and possibly timing. It's mm-hmm. just as a simple technique like that. Okay. Yeah. Today's growth story is all about search engine marketing. The company we're highlighting is Sentinel One. This challenger cybersecurity brand was set out to disrupt the endpoint protection space. Their brand was top-notch, their product was innovative, but they were struggling to gain traction online in an already developed industry. Then they found Directive Consulting, a B2B search marketing agency. Within the first quarter of working with Directive, Sentinel One was able to increase their organic traffic by 128% and overall lead volume by an outstanding 251%. Now, I have a hunch that Directive can get these kind of results for you too. So head over to directiveconsulting.com and request a totally free custom proposal. That's directiveconsulting.com. All right, let's get back to this interview. I love that. 
uh, definitely a small tweak that can change the way that it's received and the amount of information that you're you're going to be getting, um, as you mentioned there, Paul. So you also wanted to touch on a, a question that positions you as an advisor, as a consultant with your prospects. Tell us a little bit about some of the tweaks you can make in your in your questioning that position you in that way differently to the buyers that you're interacting with. Well, in the in the business to business you know, complex sale. We had uh, one client in the pharmaceutical industry and uh, MSLs are called medical science liaison. So in, in a nutshell, it was this, they're, they're kind of like not supposed, they're not allowed to sell by, you know, legal requirements, mm-hmm. FDA re- reg- regulations. However, they brought us in because they needed to have conversations with what they're called key opinion leaders. These are, you know, basically doctors having conversations with other doctors. Okay. Okay. So we were brought in and it's, it's, it's a little hilarious because first of all, I'm talking to these folks who have high IQs, highly intelligent. And, uh, and yet they're like, you know, Hey, we got to go. They have these KPIs, meaning they got to see these key opinion leaders every month. So they're like, you know, well, do we have any new data? First of all, they ha- they can have off label discussions. All that means is we have this new drug, this drug that we're using. It's, it's for diabetic application. However, off label discussion would mean is we've also found some, our research is showing us that it really is applicable for, you know, uh, multiple sclerosis and this and that. Uh-huh. Okay. Sure. That, that's what I mean. That's off label. So okay. what happens was what, what I discovered is that, you know, I, I brought in, so you don't always have to be armed with a new product or new data. The fact is, and not just these folks, all of us listening today, you're the eyes and the ears of what's going on in the marketplace. Trends, market trends, challenges, you know, where people are coming from, where they're going. Why? Because you're talking to industry leaders, you know, uh, go-getters all the time, whether it's two, three, five people a day. And you want to leverage that, your conversations, to share with others. And I say this because customers you call on are prospects. A lot of times they don't have access. They don't have the time to be talking or going to trade shows, associations. And yet now you become that footprint, that vehicle of information. Now, you're not sharing confidential information, but here's what it goes. It goes something like this, Logan. You know, and I've been talking with a number of folks in the industry, and they're telling me one of the challenges they're experiencing is others, however, are telling me, no, that's not the issue. It happens to be this. I'm curious as to what you're seeing in your marketplace and how you're dealing with it. See what Mm -hmm. I mean? Mm -hmm. You're leveraging kind of being the eyes and ears of what others are are doing. However, not being salesy, okay? Yeah. Comes across a lot different than what challenges are you facing? Right. Exactly. When, you're kind of putting mm-hmm. the problem up to Yeah, that's kind of, yeah. Are you having any problems or what problems you're having? Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's kind of like, oh, where are you going with this? Are you baiting mm-hmm. me? Whereas right. I right. want to put the, that's right. That's a good way. I put, I put what I already know are the trends because it's, I don't want to call it bait, but in a way, you know what I mean? I'm, mm-hmm. It's sort of a taste of the buffet. You mm-hmm. pick and choose what these, mm-hmm. and then what happens is that customer prospect grabs it and runs with it. Yep. It, I mean, it's twofold. It, it um, uh, affects the person on the other end differently, as you mentioned, doesn't uh, appear to be kind of this loaded question. And it also uh, speaks to the fact that you are having conversations with their peers regularly and they can chime in and disagree or they can agree and run with it and elaborate more. But the fact that you are alluding to that, um, I can see how you mentioned in, in the start that that positions you more as an advisor and a consultant because you are having numerous conversations with people in their exact same role. And so subtly working that in, I can see how that changes the positioning. Uh, I yeah. like that a lot. Let me give you an example too, because I know the audience really likes that. Uh, you know, like one example was medical um, devices, mm-hmm. and so it's classic. It's from a B two B standpoint how relevant it is because when you're trying to call on a surgeon or a doctor, you got you know, you got sometimes thirty seconds, maybe two three minutes, and uh, yeah, that, that's exactly. It. Before they brought us in, and the, one of the common questions that was coming up is, you know, form of that, or you have any problems? It was like, do you have any non unions, doctor? Non unions just means bones that aren't healing because they could they had this product that would sell well what happens when you're calling on anybody 
you know, uh, a doctor or surgeon you know, asking them if, if they have any problems, you know, that's kind of you're confronting their egos. I'm like, no, I don't have any problems, no unions. Mm-hmm. But when I do have one, you know, I'll, I'll give you a call. Leave me a card and literature and I'll see you later. Um, <laughs> so you get dismissed. Well, what happens? We changed that. So the educational question was to make it more engaging and said, you know, doctor, and this is a real life example. He, he was he was spotting this this surgeon going from room to room in the hospital, and it's like, okay, once he gets out of the room, I'll try to see if I can grab his attention for five ten seconds, and then before he gets to the next other patient room, so he got, he says, hey doctor, by the way, you know, hey, and, and you know, I guess it was a brief intro, doctor. I was thinking of you, and the reason being is I was talking to some other surgeons, and one of they were telling me is one of the challenges are facing with some of their patient populations, especially the diabetic and the beast and elderly pop they're they're finding this kind of problem however other doctors are telling me with the with the smoker population they're having this issue i'm curious as to you know based on what you know two opposing you know reactions to what's going on i'm curious as to what you're experiencing and you know what this surgeon said you know what i don't got time to talk to you right now but this is really important to me because, you know, when you mentioned the elderly and the obese, this is a growing population and I'm mm-hmm. really having a big problem with this. I'll tell you mm-hmm. what, is there any, any way you can, you know, meet me down at the uh, cafeteria at 12 noon? Cause I'd like to sit down and chat with you about right. this. Absolutely. Absolutely. Can you believe that? Now, does a, that happen I, all the time? No, mm-hmm. but that's an example of what I mean. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I love those small tweaks and how they can have uh, a really dramatic impact on what you're actually, the information you're gathering and the uh, the response you're getting from folks. Well, Paul, I, I really appreciate it. Um, you've got uh, a lot of great content out there uh, relevant to salespeople. If anybody listening to this would like to reach out to you, stay connected, find any of the resources that you've put out, would be the best way for them to go about doing that. Yeah, they can go to my name, paulcherry.com. Okay, we got an uh, incredible amount of resources, 75 best of the best questions to close more sales. And this is a great coaching tool before the call, during, after the call from a coaching standpoint, but also really from a, a guide to stimulate your thought process to make sure that you don't miss some of those important questions uh, so that you cover your bases to ensure you're going to get the sale. Uh, so we have that. I, I encourage people to do that. Um, and of course, you can reach out to me by email as well, cherry at p as in peanut, b as in boy, results.com, right? I love it. All right. Well, Paul, thank you so much for being on the show today. All right, Logan. My pleasure as well. Thank you. Digital marketing agencies have a tough job. You have to stay on top of the latest marketing strategies for your clients and your agency. What if there was a way you could address both at the same time? Imagine your agency putting out content with greater quality and quantity. Envision bringing your clients a turnkey solution for one of B2B marketing's fastest growing media strategies, podcasting. You know all those clients asking for your help with their account-based marketing efforts? Picture being the first to bring them the idea of content-based networking, showing them the proven strategy for breaking into their most coveted accounts. Here's the concept. Sweetfish Media is looking to work with a limited number of innovative agencies interested in a new partnership model. We produce a podcast for your agency. You introduce the power of podcasting and Sweetfish services to your clients. Everybody wins. Learn more at sweetfishpartners.com.